I'm going to do, touch on a subject today, and I've been kind of meditating on this for a few weeks, and I spent several days studying this out, and then when I met with Brian on a Friday night, it was a total confirmation. I mean, like big time confirmation, right? So I want to talk about the biblical doctrine of submission, okay? So, and there, there's essentials and benefits of this important spiritual posture and discipline. And in section A, as I start out here, the first thing before we get into the Word, what the Word has to say, I want to frame it, okay? So we have a place that we're all starting from together, so we understand where it fits in, why it's important, and, and what's in the Scriptures. And so the first thing I want to talk about is this term I'm using today, spiritual posture. And it's one of the many actions required, and you're, you're probably saying, uh, what do you mean by this? And this is what I mean by I want to frame it in this. So some commands give us heart tasks to do, such as when the scripture says to give generously. Giving comes from the heart, right? Some commands require to be inward, spiritually led and focused, like walk by the Spirit, right? When Paul says walk by the Spirit in Galatians, that means we are to be, it's a task where in our daily life we're spiritually led through the Holy Spirit. So we have to be spiritually sensitive. Then there are some commands in Scripture that have a physical task to go with it. Like when he tells the Thessalonians, live quietly and work with your hands. Not to be busybodies. So this literally requires for you to get busy in something. And then there are some commands that speak to our character development, such as, as Peter says in 2 Peter 1, make every effort to add to your faith moral excellence, and moral excellence, kindness, and self-control, and love, and all these things. Those are not there when you get saved. They must be added later as part of our character growth and our spiritual maturity. But here's what I want to get to today. Other commands require us to take a position or a posture, okay? That's what we're going to talk about today, this Scripture that says, submit to one another. Submitting to one another, or the biblical doctrine of submission, requires you to position yourself, right? It's not something per se that you, it's a task you do, or a character development, or a spiritually led action. It's a position that you have to take. And I'm going to tell you why as we go through the script. I got a lot of scriptures today. Is that okay? Yes. Amen? Amen. Through, through, though scripture does not use the specific term, its concept is throughout the scriptures, especially in the New Testament. In fact, it is one of the important axioms. Axiom is a statement that is taken to be true or to serve as a premise or a starting point for further reasoning, arguments, or actions to be taken. It's essential to kingdom living. Placing oneself in a spiritual posture or position is essential for life, ministry, spiritual progress, and most importantly, maintaining your health spiritually, both as an individual believer and the church body. I'm going to tell you something. This keeps you from a lot of dangers. And, there's, uh, and what I'm going to talk about today, we've all done this. Amen? So a good way to define our posture or position is, Here's a, to occupy a certain place or to be situated. So when I submit myself to God, I am placing myself in a position or I'm occupying a certain place and it requires me to be humble before the Lord. We're going to get into all that today. Amen? So one of the most important of all spiritual postures taught in Scripture, especially in lieu of new covenant living, is one of submission, or the term mutual submission. Though this word is often associated in the natural, right, in, in the negative, like if you talk about submission, you know, there are certain movements in society who say that, oh, that's an authoritarian abuse, or we're all equal. Yes, we are all equal, but we're not the same. And in the kingdom requires us to submit, to lose the position of self and move towards the, the Christ-like position of selflessness. It's unique to the kingdom in this way. Uh, it's also, there's 
a pattern and design for civilization that God has that requires it. We're going to look at that. Marriage and family, our relationship with God, our relationship with one another. And it's an essential safety net to check us or hold us accountable against pride, fleshly ego, and a plethora of sin that comes out of it. Christians, we're all very good at deceiving ourselves. We often think we know something or we're established in something and we're wrong. It's good to be humble and to listen to other people's perspectives because nobody here in this room is perfect or God has it all right. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We're going to go back to that scripture later, but I wanted to get the definition out of it right now. The word submit, hupotasso, it means to place under, to subject, to put myself under subjection. Two important Greek verbs it's made out of. The, the word hupo, or we've, in, the, in the modern Greek it'll say hypo. There's very important terms. Hupo and hooper are very important terms in lieu of spirituality. And I'm going to teach on hooper maybe next time or down the road. But hupo means below, hyper means above. So it means literally to be under or to arrange, to arrange under. To be under God's arrangement and to submit to God's plan. Amen? You have to position yourself to be in God's plan. Because he gives you, he doesn't force Lyle to be under his plan for his life. Lyle could say, well, I like nine things out of ten, Lord, but that tenth thing I'm keeping for myself. No, you're not positioning yourself under the Lord's plan. You're not submitting to it. Everybody see that? Y'all tracking me? Amen? So the proper use of the biblical view of submission places us in the proper order of God's design and pattern, especially in the essential function of human relationships and institutions. So the proper function of biblical submission opposes human pride and ego. That is what keeps you from submitting, your pride and your ego, right? Because carnality loves to bask in the light of life by self. In fact, that's the very definition of sin, is life by self apart from God. The fallen human ego, and not a soul better, better not think that they don't have this in them still, because as long as you have this, we all got it. Amen? So we're all equal there. Would you agree with me? Yes. And we have to keep it in check, don't we? So the fallen human ego resists submission and wants to do things by self-will alone without realizing the self-blinding realization that it's impossible by your own strength. You ever, you ever hear a preacher preach a message that kind of steps on your toes? That's a good thing if, it's, if he's preaching right, right? The truth hurts sometimes. It does. The truth bruises the human ego. And it's a lifestyle that we have to live because it wants to rise up in us. Amen? And I'm going to show you from the scriptures. This is the natural position of the fallen nature indicating that we have indeed taken on, we have taken on the Luciferian nature of Satan. Listen to what Paul has to say about fallen human pride in Romans the 8th chapter. For those who live according to the flesh. Notice that underlined set in your minds. It's an important concept here. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on flesh is hostile to God. You ever see people make fun of Christians or make fun of the Bible? You see, you know, especially atheists and things of that nature. Because their mind is set on their flesh and they're hostile to God. Read 1 Corinthians chapters 1-3. through Paul explains this on late, at length to the Corinthians. For it does not submit to, to God's law. Indeed, say it with me, it cannot. You hear that? 
Your flesh cannot submit to God's law. Only by the governing influence of the Holy Ghost through the shed blood of Jesus Christ are we given the ability to submit to God's law. And then it takes an act of faith where you have to walk it out and believe it and do it then on your side of it, right? Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So here we clearly see that the posture of the flesh does not align itself under the Lordship of Christ. Colossians 1.8, Paul says Christ is the head of the church. We all must posture ourselves under this reality of Christ's supreme authority. Amen? So if Christ is the head of the church, Brian and I have no chance. <laughs> Even try it out, right? <laughs> no minister, no person, nobody. Only one person occupies that position. So we start out from the beginning that Jesus Christ occupies a position that only he can. So I'm going to go through seven uh, themes throughout Scripture here, uh, that, and we're going to study seven points of submission. Number one is submission to God. Number two is submission to the Scriptures. Number three is submission to spiritual leadership. Number four is submission inside of the nuclear family. Number five is submission within the family of believers. Number six, governing authorities and bosses. And number seven, submission within the boundaries of our ministry graces. So now we're going to break it on down. Number one, submitting to God. Submitting ourselves under God, and specifically the Lordship of Christ, is the most important of the most important spiritual posture. This is the first and foremost. Nothing else matters if you don't get this right. In fact, until you come into an agreement with this most fundamental reality, I don't think you can be saved, according to the Scriptures. Listen to James 4. Do you suppose that it is no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealousy over the Spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. How do you resist the devil? By submitting yourself to God. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. This is talking about to the prideful person, right? Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. I've been in season under the discipline of the Lord, right? And I'll tell you what, there's nothing more humbling than that. That's right. Amen. When the Lord brings you under His discipline, you'll know when it's Him. You can tell the difference when there's just a trial, and, and, and it's, it's just stuff you're going through that has nothing to do with God saying or seeing anything in you, but you'll know when it's the Lord. I knew, no doubt, when it was the Lord. It, it came to me really quick, and the Lord put me on my back and took a season where I had to rebuild and deconstruct and rebuild, deconstruct and rebuild, and I said, Lord, I'm going to completely submit myself to you Cleanse me of all my wrong beliefs, my wrong theology, my bad spirit, and rebuild me. I want to be like you. And I don't care if I ever step foot in a church again. i got to get this right. And I took a season where I did that. And the Lord did mighty things. I could talk all night about my testimony, what he did in that time period. So you have to humble yourselves. What happened after I humbled myself? The grace came, and after the grace came, I was exalted by the Lord. And I stand here before you today, if I was not ready to, if I did not take that season, I would not be standing here today. God doesn't need me to, to, to minister. There's a million other people out there. Right. But he wanted me to follow his plan, and he had a plan for me, and he wanted me to submit to that plan, and I submitted to that plan, and all of a sudden... A door knocked. It was Tom Kempf at my door. And lo and behold, long story, here I am, right? You all know the story. Amen. So, you've got to humble yourselves. None of us know everything. 
How about take a season where if another believer has a different perspective on something, the Bible says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. You may think you're right. I could have sworn I was right. I was determined I was right. I was pastoring a charismatic church and I was like, I got this. It's all about tongues. And you're going to get it. It's all about mm, all these different things. And I said, when the Lord came, I said, Lord, I was wrong. And I'm going to shut my mouth and learn from you. Amen? Amen? But I could have sworn I was just like the Pharisees. The Pharisees really thought, and they were using the Scripture. They were using the Scripture against Jesus. To call yourself God was blasphemy. They got that from the law. And yet there was God Almighty standing before him. The Son of Man. Number two, submitting to God's Word. This is a big one. One of the problems in the modern church... We have all kinds of narratives out there, right? And everybody has a narrative, and they want to bend the scriptures to fit their narrative. <clears throat> Good biblical hermeneutics involves the first rule. Lord, I don't want this to say, I am not determined that this says anything right now. Whatever I'm studying, right? I want to know what the truth is, regardless of what I think. So, here's again, you submit your beliefs, you submit your theology to the Word of God. If you believe this about something, and God shows you in the Word otherwise, you have two choices. You cannot submit yourself to it, you can manipulate the Scriptures to fit your paradigm, or you can say, I was wrong on my belief in that area. You know how many times I said that the Lord had to correct me in my theology? And you know me, I'm a voracious studier. Ask my wife. Voracious. I'm constantly fine-tuning and correcting myself and getting the bigger picture. We have to submit ourselves that nobody in here knows everything. Amen? Amen. Amen. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Run that in the negative. If you don't follow the scripture, if you want more yourself from the scripture, you're not going to be able to teach, you're not going to be reproved, you're not going to be corrected, you're not going to be trained in righteousness, and you're going to be incomplete and unequipped. And we have a million churches out there running around under this, the opposite of this. 1 Corinthians 4 and 6. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. And none of you be puffed up in favor one against the other. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? He's talking about teaching here. He's talking about the false apostles that were coming in, and the Judaizers, and the Gnostics, and, and these different challengers that came against Paul throughout his <laughs> ministry. And they're teaching stuff outside of Scripture. You think, do, do we see that today, Pastor Brian? Is there teachings filling the churches right now that are outside or beyond Scripture? If you, if you haven't seen it, come to my house sometime and I'll spend a few hours with you. Puffed up. Puffed up. They, they, they think that they have the latest revelation. Look at me. Look how spiritual I am. It's like that on social media. You have the YouTube and Facebook and Instagram preachers, right? And they put these quotes, and they put their names on them, and I hate that. And they put this sugar candy out there that does not even, half of it's not even biblical. But they just want to get likes and shares. That's the time we live in right now. Number three. Here's one. That gets wrong all the time. Spiritual leadership. God designed spiritual leadership to under-shepherd his flocks until Christ's return. God designed spiritual leadership graces. See, 
Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, like 11 through 16, 17, 18. It's, and it's patterned after Christ's ministry. And certain individuals, not a lot, not everybody, a few individuals are graced in the fivefold ministry to lead and under shepherd God's church. And it is essential that the church respect this part of God's design for the church. So there's two things here. Number one, a spiritual leader should be skilled, seasoned, and ready before he goes into ministry. Right? Not perfect. There's no perfect preacher. God knows I'm not perfect. Brian will tell you right up front he's not. But there's, just because a, you know, I, I remember being a zealous, you know, 24-year-old man, I'm going to change the world for Christ. I wasn't ready, even though I was called. You have to be seasoned, and you have to be skilled in the Word, and your life has to be decent and in order, as Paul says in 2 Timothy and 1 Timothy. But listen to this one. Hebrews 13 and 17, the writer of Hebrews says to the church, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. Okay, so here's the thing. You can ask my wife this. She's my witness. When this scripture hit me, back about 10 years ago, like really hard, I said, I better study, even. I better get my, my stuff in order. Because I'm going to have to answer for every word I'm saying up here. That's a burden to bear. That's why leadership graces have a certain type of grace in that. I said, Lord, I ask of you one thing. And you can knock me on my behind again. Don't let me teach false doctrine. I may not get everything perfectly. Nobody expect that's not the, the it, nobody can get it all right, right? We, we see in part, we prophesy in part. Don't, please God, I don't want to be one of these false teachers. I don't want to get an ego trip and also go in left field. Then the Lord said, I want you to preach the foundations the rest of your life. Don't worry about all that stuff. Stick with the most important truths. And as, as Peter said, reteach them. Reteach them. You reteach them. I've already taught stuff to, the, to you know, when, I, when we were race gathering. Uh, gosh, I've taught stuff three, four times in a row. Same message. Why? Because it takes repetition. That's, that is shown to us by the apostolic teaching. Amen? Submit to your leaders. They're keeping watch. We have to keep a calm. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. Now let me tell you something. I have had individuals that I have had a lot of groaning over. I have sat in counseling with individuals. I said, here's... And I don't... I, you know me. I'm, I'm not a, a bossy person. Because leadership is comes beside, not rank over. Right? It's a servant place leadership. And so... I go, I, oh, here's what the scripture says and what I think might be a good idea for you. And I would give them like three things. And they do completely the opposite. And then my phone rings three months later. It's a disaster right now. Okay, did you do one, two, or three? No. You went to the opposite. And then I groan. Ask my wife. She hears privately <laughs> my groaning. Thank God for, thank God for my wife, right? So listen, you, sometimes you have to respect the position even if you don't respect the man. You hear what I'm saying? Hopefully I've earned your respect as a man. But you have to respect the position. When Miriam rebelled against Moses and talked behind his back, the Lord dealt with her harshly. And Aaron, God is not pleased when you backstab or talk bad about a sound minister. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm not saying it for myself because it's scriptural. Uh, we'll go to 1 Peter. So I exhort the elders amongst you, and here's, here's a, here, this is speaking to shepherds, as a fellow elder 
and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is amongst you. You know what that statement means? You preach the word, you counsel, you heal, you encourage, you use your shepherd staff to bring the, the ones that are drifting. You keep people in a safe pasture and you watch out for the wolves. Why do you think I'm so hardcore about sound teaching? Because all of you can turn on your television and you're going to be exposed to bad teaching. Right. Sorry, I'm just telling you the truth. And if, you, if you don't believe me, I'll sit down with you all day if you want and explain my reasoning. Right, Sean? That's part of shepherding. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain. Oops. We don't ever see that, do we? Preachers with Lear jets. <clears throat> but eagerly, listen to this. Brian and I, have, we've, just, we've talked about this before. Not domineering over those you are in charge, but being examples to the flock. I've been under dominant pastor before. Abusive, controlling, manipulative. It's not a fun day when that happens. So pastors are under just as much, if not more, scrutiny than everybody else in the flock is. Amen? And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, those who are younger be subject to the elders. This is a big one. In God's design, the young are supposed to learn from the old. The old are supposed to be wise. The old should have sound, healthy lives. They should be mature believers. They should be established in the faith. They should know the scriptures in excellence. And you should be an example to the young people. We have a huge disconnect in the church today, and that's why it's failing. Because there's a separation between the old and the young, and both are at fault. Just the way it is. But, but the way that God designed it is the younger are supposed to submit to the older people. And there's a lot of there's a lot of ego in younger people. I remember being a young man. Yeah, I don't know that old guy. What does he know? Right? <laughs> and the younger women and the younger men, the scriptures both say to both of them, the older women are supposed to teach. The older women are supposed to teach the younger women and then be examples to them and, and show them what it means to, to be a good wife and, and a good mother to their children and an excellent in the body of Christ, serving one another. And the young men the same. The, he goes on to say, Peter says, clothe yourself, all, say all of you, all of you with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Isn't that powerful? Clothe yourself. The Greek word means to sink into a garment, as if a garment. It's supposed to be a part of you. Amen? Number four, the nuclear family. There's a lot of scripture here. I'm not going to get deep into this. You can read it. But God's pattern and design clearly seen by his instruction inside of the nuclear family. This is not a dictatorship, but it's supposed to lovingly reflect Christ's ministry to the church within the home. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit everything to their husbands. And it goes on to say, husbands, love your wives as Christ Loved the church and gave himself up for her. So look, this is a mutual, <coughs> submitted circle here. Right? Husbands and wives. It's a circle. And when you keep the circle, it's, you reflect God's best. Amen? And it goes on. The, the, the husband says, verse 33, Let each one of you love his wife as himself. And then let the wife see to it that she respects the husband. Very interesting that men pray for respect and women pray for love. And here it is, the Holy Spirit, knowing how he created us, 
in our design, is teaching through the, uh, through the Apostle Paul here, just basic human nature. Uh, you know, wives, if you really want to put a wedge in your marriage, be bossy, overbearing, and disrespectful to your husband. That's a man's love language. Men, be gentle, loving, tender-hearted, provide for her, care for her, talk softly, read her body language when she's having a bad day. That's called loving your wife, right? Not screaming and yelling and domineering over her and on the man of the house. Get that ego out of here. See, see that it's a mutually submitted beneficial circle. And when you do it that way, you have a healthy marriage and family. In the same way, children, obey your parents as in the Lord. For this is right, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and you live long in your land. In the same way, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction in the Lord. You know, I've seen this so many times. When you start riding your kid about something, and, and you just start slamming them, all you're doing is making a man and driving them away at some point. Or overly controlling. You know, I see it with some of my, my kids, their friends come over, and these horror stories, what happens in their homes with their parents. This one poor girl, it's like, her mother controls her so much, she's got like 15 minutes to come, and she's got to be back home. And she has the, you know, all this list of stuff to do, and then her dad's screaming and yelling at her, and it's like, you're provoking. You wonder why your kid goes into rebellion. <laughs> you wonder why I do that, just watch your kid go into rebellion. And then don't dare say it's because, it's, it, because they are under demonic spirit. The demonic spirit is you. <laughs> Sometimes. Number five, we're getting close to the end. Family of believers, central in the church, when there's an atmosphere of grace. If you're, anybody ever been in, in a, not a very grace-filled church? I remember the very last stop that I made, the pastor got just ripped everyone to shreds because people were having too much friendly get-togethers in the beginning of the church. He says, this needs to be a somber atmosphere that we reflect on our sin. I said, oh, I'm not going to be here much longer. The joy of the Lord is our strength. There's joy in the fellowship. When you become controlling and legalistic, and it's all about rules and regulations, it's not good. You have to have an atmosphere of grace. Is there enough grace in this church that if Margaret was struggling with something really severe, say it's something sinful, could she come to you and share that with Is there grace there? Could she come to you and say, I need, I need to share something and I need some help and I need someone to talk to? Is there grace? Are you able to gracefully minister to that person in the midst of their struggle? You know, it should be a safe place for us to be submitted and humble to one another. Are you struggling with drinking too much? Are you, are you struggling with being covetous? Are you struggling, name a million things, could it be pornography or, or, or lust? Or, are, is there an atmosphere of grace? Can people from the world walk in here and, and would we have an atmosphere of grace towards them? Or God forbid you have some tattoos, right? Ben and church is like that. God forbid. No, there needs to be an atmosphere of grace. Ephesians 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. James 5 and 16 says, confess your sins. And the term here that uh, James is using is your, your, not so much the sinfulness, it's the faults that you have, right? Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another. Do we do that? That you may be healed. Right? And it's not talking necessarily about a sickness. It's talking about a spiritual malignancy. You know, there's, there's people 
that I deal with in counsel that's nobody's business, that's private, I pray with them. Because they need healing from addictions and sinful patterns. They know that they're in sin. They don't need to be reminded. You know, the last thing that you need sometimes, you know that's a sin, but why do you think I'm talking to you? <laughs> that's not, that's an accusation, right? It's, it's a different when a person doesn't want to admit to something and you've got to confront them, right? But when someone's coming to you with a struggle, you need to go to grace mode. Amen? Amen? Six, government bosses. Boy, oh boy. They're, this is the one thing that speaks to the natural world in our relationship with it, right? Titus 3 and 1 says, Remind them to be submissive to rules and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Speak evil of no one. Uh-oh. We didn't do too well in that in, in, in the election process the last time. Everybody. <clears throat> Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling, but be gentle. Show perfect courtesy towards all people. Isn't it interesting that Emperor Tiberius, who reigned when Jesus did as Emperor of Rome, was a pervert and a pedophile and a murderer. And Jesus said, pay your taxes to Caesar and be good citizens. He never confronted them because he was on a higher mission to preach the kingdom. And when you preach the kingdom of God, maybe Caesar would hear the gospel and then he would change. That's how it's supposed to be done. We're not going to make Christianity and advance the kingdom through the voting booth or a flag that we carry. It's just, it's just the reality. We have to be careful of those things. And look at Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except God. Read that section sometime. It, again, pay your taxes. Don't be troublemakers in your communities. Be good citizens. Make a good testimony where you live. We're not going to solve all the world problems. We're not. But we were supposed to live as salt and light in our communities. 1 Peter 2.13, 2, be subjected for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or the governor sent by him. You get the picture here? Three, three preachings on this thing, mentioned in scripture. Finally, the boundaries of ministry grace. There exists a mutual submission in our relationship with our ministry graces between all ministry functions in the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things done for the building up. And it goes on to verse 32. It says, talking about when you're giving a word. It said that the spirits of the prophets are subject or submitted to the prophets. So it's kind of an all-encompassing example that Paul's making there. So if we're teachers, we are submitted to one another as teachers. See that? We hold each other accountable in our teaching. If your gift is, like say you give a word of knowledge, then you have to submit that. The Bible says to test all things. So even in all of our gifts here, we have to be submitted to that gift, to the parameters that surround that gift. Amen? Like, for instance, a prophet, a test of a prophet is, number one, whether what they say comes to pass, and number two, it is backed up by Scripture. Amen? So they're subject, they're submitted in that protocol to keep the church healthy and safe. So let's wrap it up. Here's the benefits of submission. And the, there's, I identified four primary re realities or blessings that come out of biblical submission that are important, you're going to need in your lives. Number one, humbleness. I think I've hit on that a lot in these scriptures, right? Humbleness is a fruit of biblical submission. God gives grace 
to the humble. You, who wants more grace in their life? Five people? All right. Well, I, I'll keep going. I guess I'll preach. <laughs> well, you have to position yourself to receive grace by being. Secondly, accountability. These are protocols. We just read the scripture in James. Healing comes out of biblical submission. Right? Confess your faults to one another. You have to humble yourself. You have to come to another believer, submit that to them, and what happens? Healing. Number three, order. With submission, keeps you in God's pattern and design and His will for your life. And you have what's called progress and spiritual maturity are fruits of it. That comes out of biblical submission. You cannot grow without being submitted. You cannot make progress if you're a rebel. You stop growing, you hit a ceiling. Your ceiling is wherever you're into, right? And a fourth reality that comes out of biblical submission is obedience. Obedience. Obedience directly has attached to it the rewards and blessings. That's a whole teaching in and of itself. Right, Deb? Obedience. That's a whole nother, so, tons of scripture on it. That comes out of biblical submission. When I submit to God, I'm going to be obedient to what he asks of me. But it requires me to position myself under his lordship. And then, there are the dangers of being uns unsubmitted. So, if you're not humble, what's going to manifest in your life is pride, ego, and carnality. Amen? If you're not accountable, you know what comes out of that? Addictions and destructive behaviors. <clears throat> Somebody coming out of natural addiction to alcohol or drugs, and Neil will tell you this, one of the number one things that that person needs is accountability. You have to, in, in AA, right, you have a sponsor. Correct. And that, I said, correct. I yep, correct. you have a sponsor. And you are, your sponsor is your accountability partner, yes. right? And the accountability partner helps strengthen you to get distance between you and your addiction because the farther you get away from it, the more you have overcome it and it becomes less a, a part of your life, amen? It's the same thing in the church. Order. Where you don't have order, you have moral and spiritual chaos. Do we see that in society right now? Perfect time. We are literally in a time period where we are changing the very order of creation. It's just where we're at. I'm not going to mock anybody or condemn anybody, but the fact is, we are now in a place where we are rebelling against the very order of many things. Amen? And out of it, now we have moral and spiritual chaos. Every man does what is right in their own eyes. You know the scripture from the Old Testament. And finally, the opposite of obedience is rebellion. The polar opposites. When you rebel, you don't walk in the blessings of God. It's just that simple. It's that, I don't even have to argue that point, right? So in closing, the purpose of biblical submission is not a top-down authoritarian control or a lording over others. Jesus talked about Matthew 20, 25, the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, but it is not to be that way with you, for the least of you is the greatest, and the greatest of the least. Right? No servant is greater than his master, on and on and on, but it is about a loving and protective defense. This is how we got to view it. A loving and protective defense against the dangers of pride and carnality. It keeps believers in the right spiritual posture as to not derail or inhibit our progress as individuals and or local bodies of believers. Being submitted under God's order in all things is one key aspect of living a fruitful life, receiving more grace, spiritually maturing, and manifesting the kingdom of God in a carnal world. 
Christ is glorified most when things are in order of God's design and pattern. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite Brian up here to close us out. I thank you for um, the opportunity to minister the word to you today. I hope that you are edified and encouraged. Amen? Amen.